Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. This is a, such a wonderful turnout for this event. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Kate Gervais. I, by day, I work for the Worcester County Conservation District. Um, on the third Tuesday of every month, I'm a, a member of the Rutland Agricultural Commission as well. Um, and I want to recognize the wonderful organizations that came together to, uh, to bring you this, uh, this event today, the tree fruit pruning lecture and subsequent uh, field component. So uh, we have two AGCOMs, the Holden AGCOM and the Rutland AGCOM. And I want to recognize that this is the fifth lecture in their educational series. You can expect the next one in May or June. They tried to do them uh, quarterly. Uh, this time they invited the Rutland Agriculture Commission. If you folks can, can give a wave as well. I see Glenn and Deb and Randy back there, thank you. Um, so they invited Rutland to partner on this as well. Um, and agricultural commissions, I just want to let you all know that those are volunteers. They are appointed uh, an appointed board by the town. They get together usually monthly, maybe quarterly, and discuss all sorts of different agricultural issues in town, or um, not issues, I don't want to use that word, but um, they're very supportive of farming and agriculture in that community in general. So that's, uh, it's really exciting that they can bring a group like this together. Um, like I said, by day I work for the Worcester County Conservation District. I'm a soil conservationist and uh, the, the, each county has a conservation district that's served again by a volunteer board. It's a quasi-state organization. Um, I work indirectly with the NRCS. I work in the USDA office up the hill. And one of the things that the district is trying to bring to you is technical assistance, uh, maybe on a smaller scale, because we all know that Worcester County is becoming increasingly urbanized. Uh, maybe some of you folks have small farms. Maybe you have backyard gardens that you're looking for technical assistance on that you think, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not agriculture, or, or maybe the USDA is just too big to help me. Well, you can call up the Worcester County Conservation District and I can come help you out. Um, one of the things that we started offering this past year was a soil sampling service. So I would come to your house or your farm and take soil samples, bring them back to my office, prepare them for the lab, send them off to UMass, and you get a report. And uh, I call you up and go over that report with you. So if that's something that you're interested in, we have a sign-up sheet going around for just um, general information. But be sure to grab a card or reach out from, to me um, about that. That's been really successful. and. Uh, we're trying to offer, like I said, technical assistance and a little bit of educational uh, type events for you. Um, the other um, event that we have coming up, Mackenzie's going to talk about our seedling sale. The brochures are hot off the press. All right. Yeah. I'll do it now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, my name is Mackenzie Bay. I am the plant and seedling sale coordinator for the Worcester County Conservation District. Uh, this is my fifth year with them coordinating their one and only true fundraiser for the year. Um, the brochures are hot off the presses. We picked them up yesterday, and the sale went live today. So you can place your orders right on the website, or you can uh, fill this out and mail it back to me. Um, pick up this year is on Saturday, May 4th. It runs from 9 a.m. to noon at six different farm locations across the county. So whether you're from North County and you want to go to Red Apple Farm or you're from South County and you would like to pick up at Douglas uh, Orchard and Farm right in the town of Douglas, uh, you can do that. So this year our focus is living off your land and we are providing plant offerings like elderberries, um, really good hardwood trees, raspberries, a couple different types of vegetables. We're doing actually tomato plants this year for the first time and lettuces and zucchini squash and all of those will be uh, grown certified organic by a farm in Charlton. So that is the first, uh, this is the first time we're going to offer something for an annual garden. Usually we focus on a perennial garden. Um, there is a promo code running right now for 10% off your order, so you can learn more about that on the website. It's just for the first launch weekend. We do it every single year. So um, if you order this weekend, uh, I think the promo code is plants or 2019 plants, but it's right on the website. Um, and you can enter that and get 10% off uh, this weekend. My other hat, just like Kate, I wear multiple hats, um, is I am the uh, executive director for Central Mass Grown. And Central Mass Grown is the by local organization for Worcester County. So we have this resource for you, and this is a directory of farms in Worcester County. Um, there's some informational articles and flip charts and things to help keep you in tune with agriculture in your district. So you can pick that up in the back, and if you would like to get more involved, I'm here to chat with you about it. 
All right. Thanks, guys. Um, one other thing I, d I want to mention, we've had some inquiries. We have, um, for those of you who've been with the district for a long time and are familiar with us, we have a beautiful new logo as of 2018. Um, we have a sample of one of the shirts in back. If you're interested in, in um, some sort of um, product like that, we will be doing an, an order of probably all sorts of different products, but um, maybe make a note of it on the sign-in sheet if you're interested in a t-shirt or a tote bag, or something like that. Um, we're very proud of our, our beautiful new logo and we want to get it out there where everybody else can see it. Um, the other group that I want to recognize is um, Sholin Farms. They will be hosting the next portion, the field portion of this workshop. Um, Joanne, where are you? Oh, you're right in front of me. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> so we featured speaker is Mr. John Clements. Uh, he's a native Vermonter, received his, his bachelor's in wildlife management at the University of Vermont, and his uh, master's in plant and soil science. Uh, shortly thereafter, he took a job with Michigan State University Extension uh, as a horticultural agent, and he returned to New England in 2000 as an extension tree fruit specialist at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, he takes great pride in being able to provide one-on-one -on -one and one-to-many extension outreach to Massachusetts and New England orchardists, such as yourselves, uh, with, an en with an emphasis on modern intensive orchard production practices and integrated pest management. He's based at the UMass Cold Spring Orchards in Belchertown. It's a beautiful facility, I can say that, uh, where he also manages numerous applied research and demonstration orchards, uh, blocks of apples, peaches, and cherries. And uh, I asked him his favorite fruit product, and he said, any apple that's baked into a pie. <laughs> So, without further ado, I will hand it over. Uh, wow. Let me tell you, um, I'm very impressed. Um, I don't want to bore you to death. I can kind of go on and on about a lot of uh, off-topic stuff. One of the, uh, let me just start by saying, you know, when Jim, I don't know, when Jim Dunn contacted me, it was probably November, December, you know, I always say, okay, yeah, fine, whatever, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we started exchanging some emails, trying to figure out what and how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there was some discussion about having an outside pruning session, which actually I personally would really rather do. Pruning is very difficult to teach in a lecture, so to speak. And I don't want this to become a lecture. It might. But I, I don't want it to become a lecture. Anyways, to make a long story short, it's great that... This could be integrated with an outdoor program at Sholin Farms, too. Of course, I guarantee you the weather in two weeks will not be nearly as nice as this, probably, <laughs> just because I'm a pessimistic kind of guy. <laughs> but anyway, to make a long story short, you know, I've done these kind of talks before. I have a talk, I have a talk or two in the bag, so to speak, on pruning. Um, it's been a busy kind of, I don't know, two or three weeks for various reasons. One is we had a big Massachusetts Fruit Growers Association uh, annual meeting at the Great Wolf Lodge back in January where we had over a hundred growers attend and let me just address that my main job my only job really well my main job is to work with the commercial orchards in Massachusetts of which frankly there's about a hundred big ones or you know substantial ones my my the people I work with are only about a hundred that I primarily work with and I, I, my, I am 100% extension. You can't see the extension logo too well. There is one down here. I just plugged that in yesterday. 
Before I forget, let me give credit for this talk also to Dr. Wesley Audio. This is a talk he teaches a pruning class. Am I getting a little feedback on this? Is it me or? Thank you, Chris. And um, there we go, that's better. Anyways, Dr. Wesley Audio teaches pruning to students at UMass and they take a semester long course. I don't, my, I don't teach students. I'm 100% extension, I'm not faculty. I don't have a PhD. I'm what's considered professional staff. But like I said, as my, my job is to take, for example, the research that Audio and Dr. Dwayne Green and Daniel Cooley, we have a team at UMass that does research. My main job is to take some of those research results bring them to the growers um, so the growers can apply some of the new knowledge that maybe is coming out of their research. It's not just UMass. In this day and age, we get a lot of information from a lot of places. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. You know, my kind of, I'm kind of on call with the growers, and if somebody has a problem, I try and go out and troubleshoot with them. So I'm kind of like free help. And you know what they say about you get what you pay for, but that's okay. Um, but I just... Like I said, anyways, as part of extension, extension likes to do. We have to we have to undergo professional development from time to time, and we had a professional development program this past Monday. After I got back from a week in St. Croix, I shouldn't have come back, yeah. obviously. And anyways, just to, <laughs> they kind of asked. Um, it was kind of like, um, well, how do you handle difficult situations with the public or dealing with people now? Most of the people like Joanne, they're pretty easy to get along with. We, we, I don't have too many difficult situations with my audience, nor do I do with the public. But they kind of asked me, well, what's your, what's your take on dealing with the public? I said, well, I really don't like dealing with the public. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I'm, and I'm being, it's not, this is not what I do a lot of, is, is lecture, so to speak, to people I don't know. I have a tendency to lecture to people I do know or personally very well over time. So I don't do as much of these. Just, I also realized this week um, that I've actually started at the University of Vermont as a research technician in orchards, in their research orchard, this month in 1989. So that's 30 years ago. And I, when I started there, I, I, I was a science major and I did odd jobs, short order cook, et cetera, et cetera, after getting out of college before I got that job. And I was brand new. I knew nothing about orchards. They, I don't know why they hired me. Actually, there's a backstory to that. I don't know why they hired me. They did. But I, everything I learned, or most of what I learned, I was at the University of Vermont as a research technician for 10 years. You know, I did learn quite a bit. And I had a, a faculty member who was quite... Um, you know, wanted me, he thought I would be good working in extension, and so we did a lot of extension and research stuff together. And then I went to Michigan State University, which is a big, uh, in Berrien County, which is in southwest Michigan, which is a big fruit producing county, and I was their county extension agent for two years. That was a real eye-opener in extension. I got a lot of experience then. Then I came to the University of Massachusetts in 2000 for various reasons, and I've been working with the fruit growers in Massachusetts since 2000, and it's been a I consider a lot of them my friends, um, a lot of them are friends, and it's, it's fun working with this group. Um, Massachusetts apple production, it's primarily apples, we do some peaches, but apple production is the, the, the biggest one. We produce about a million bushels of apples in this state. Um, New York and Michigan each produce 25 million bushels, 25 times the quantity Massachusetts does. Washington produces over 100 million bushels, so 100 times what, what, what Massachusetts does. So I like to remind the growers how lucky they are to have a dedicated person such as myself they can call on in such a fairly small state. However, our industry is very um, retail, um, direct market centric. So the apple growers, am I going on too long about this? Does it, uh, the apple growers get a lot of bang for their buck and are, have you know, recently been very successful, and it's thanks to things like ag commissions that you know, various people have, have promoted, MDAR, the Department of Agricultural Resources, um, and support from the local community, and like, you know, the turnout here, and you guys are really lucky to have the, I wanna say back in where I am from Western Mass, I, I haven't seen this kind of um, conservation district support and facilities and we have other things going on but it's just great to do that so 
that's all the backstory, I think. Um, but anyways, it's a very nice facility. I thank you for having me. Before I get going, this, this could be kind of long. I'm going to try and move right along. Let me ask you a question. Though. How many people have fruit trees at home? So a lot of you do. I mean, probably you wouldn't be here otherwise if you didn't. You'd be doing something else Saturday morning. Um, uh, how many, I'm just trying to think, do you prune your trees every year? You try? Some do, some don't. You came here to learn more about pruning. All right, I'm going uh, <laughs> to, and I like to say that the longer I'm in this business, the more confused I get. Because there's no right or wrong answers kind of with this stuff. It's, it's, it's very subjective there's both you know it's a lot of people like to say it's artistic I'm not I'm not I can't I'm not an artistic person I think it's more science if you understand kind of some of the physiology of the tree it's a little bit easier to prune I think and the other thing is you just got to get out there and do it don't be afraid because chances are yeah you can screw it up but if you if you if you take home a few of the messages I'm going to give you, you won't be messing it up too bad. Now I'm also going to focus on apples. So who has who has other trees besides apples? Like what do you got? Peaches. I will do a little bit of peaches. I'm not going to get into cherries. And let me just tell you that uh, uh, apples and cherries and pears are all kind of the same. There's whatever I say about apples, you could apply two cherries and pears. What am I missing? Plums. I don't do plums, by the way. Just don't do them. <laughs> just prune them. Just prune them some. Plums are, you know, just prune them some because, again, I'm, you know, peaches are the only ones that is really different than apples. Although the, the, some of the principles are the same, but just their fruiting habit is different. So, all right, let's dig in because I, like I said, I can drone on and on and bore, bore people to death. I get accused of that all the time, but I'll, once we get going here, we'll move on. All right. So we're going to try and make it fairly simple. And if you've got questions, go ahead and raise your hand after each slide or whatever. We'll just see where we end up. I just, the other thing is, of course, uh, yesterday morning I said, oh, i got to give this talk tomorrow. I better, uh, <laughs> I better make, see where my talks are and go find them. The last time I gave one was a year ago. And I, I kind of combined a couple of talks I had, including um, Wes Audio's talk. But, so it may seem a little disjointed, but hopefully it won't be too bad. But this is really important to understand the fruiting habit, because that's the goal. You want to have some fruit. I mean, you want to have some apples. And you'll see, I'll give you some examples of this, but the important thing about apples is to remember they fruit on two-year-old and older wood. Flower buds develop on spurs, which are kind of short shoots, on two-year-old and older wood. So if you go prune a tree and you cut out all that, it's hard to do. You can't do it. If you cut out a lot of that older wood, what do you think is going to happen? You're not going to have any apples. The best fruit occurs on two, three, four, maybe a little older wood. Okay? So when you prune, you want to focus on having that two, three, and, and I'll explain a little bit more. And you'll see this outside for those of you who go outside. Again, it's really easier to explain outside. But you want to have this kind of what I call middle-aged wood is where you get your best apples. So you've got but to get that middle-aged wood, you've also got to grow some new wood. And you have to get rid of some of the older wood that's, you know, not useful anymore. Say has fruited for two, three, or four years. The buds and spurs, they weaken as they get older. And, you know, it's just harder to have good, have them be productive as they get older. Um, when I say shade is your enemy, so I get calls from homeowners like, my, how come my apple trees don't have any apples on them? And this is why I don't like dealing with the public. <laughs> <laughs> I, first thing I say, um, well, did it flower? And sometimes they say, yeah, I had flowers on them. Okay, and then we go from another story. They say, nah, I didn't have too many flowers. And I said, well, you know, does it, get, does it get a lot of sunlight? Does it basically get full sunlight all day? Oh, no, it's kind of my house shades it for half the day. Well, I said, okay, well, that's a problem because apple trees really, they need to, to grow fruit buds. They need full sun. So let me just, if your apple trees at home or whatever are not getting two-thirds to three-quarters of a day of good sunshine, it's going to be hard to grow apples on those trees, okay? But also within the canopy of the tree, this is part of the reason we prune, as trees get older, the canopy creeps out and gets bigger, 
and you, therefore that's getting all the light. Now we prone to let some light into the lower part of the canopy, so we have fruiting throughout the canopy. That's why shade is your enemy. All things being equal, when we're growing and pruning, we want to focus on maintaining wood. When I say wood, any branches, shoots, or whatever is horizontal versus vertical. Okay? So what's a good, if you're going to start out with, what's one good simple rule of pruning? You can't, you can't say it. <laughs> right, vertical wood. So there's one simple, and I'll get to that. I'll get to that, but, okay? All right, here just quickly, you know, here's the fruiting habit. Let me just, if I, can you see that kind of? So this, this actually is what we call one-year-old wood. This shoot grew last year, if you can see it. So at the beginning of the spring, whatever year, last year, the end of the shoot was right here, and this grew. Can you see that? Yeah. Now, there are no, this will not have any flowers on it, and it won't produce any fruit. As we go back, this is what we call, as we go back and get older, this is perhaps two-year-old, it grew two years ago, and three-year-old wood. These are the little spurs. And that's where your flowers will be and your fruit will come from. So it's kind of important when you're looking at your trees to recognize that. Because if you, like I said, it's, what you don't want to, what you want to do is keep some of this growing every year and keep it so it becomes this. Now, the, one of the most common mistakes I see people prune is um, they, you know, they say cut out wood that's stuff going up. Well, this has a tendency to go up. But unless you keep some of this one-year-old wood, it'll never become this. All right. I kind of already talked about this. You want to create a balance between fruiting wood and new shoot growth, which will become fruiting wood. Remove the old wood. Why? Because it will help stimulate new growth, and the older wood does not produce fruit as readily. Create an even light environment throughout the tree. I hesitate to bring up the subject of spraying because some people don't want to spray and blah, 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 which is all fine. But if, from the commercial growers, one of the main reasons we prune is because we have to grow perfect fruit. So we have to spray fungicides and insecticides to keep the fruit looking good. We have to be able to get the spray into the tree canopy. But that's, you know, kind of a lot of people will say that's a good reason for pruning. I also want to create a structure to support the crop load. You know, it's interesting when we have ice storms and stuff, bad ice storms, apple orchards are rarely affected. Because, again, the apple trees are kind of pruned with the goal of having an all, you know, see good structure of the tree to support the weight of the apples. People ask me, you know, if we have bad ice storm, oh, are the apple trees hurt? Very rarely are they bothered by ice storms. Any questions, comments up to this point? Is this all, you all know this already, or is it kind of like, <clears throat> think of stuff, food for thought? Yep, question. I'll, I'll pause like every four or five slides and see what questions we've got. So I don't quite understand. Um, you've got that example of the new wood coming out and then going up, but at the same time you want to make sure that the outside canopy doesn't shade the inside. So that seems contradictory. Well, it can be. I mean, you've got to, you know, it, you have to, and it'll hopefully become a little clearer. And part of the way you kind of solve that situation is by pruning and removing wood that might be shading that area. And you also, over time, have to keep kind of trees within their space. So you can, you, you got, you're going to be taking out some of that one-year-old wood, but you've got to make sure you leave some of it too. Okay. All right. This whole concept of a central leader tree is what we do in commercial orchards. Some of you may or may not, I'm guessing a lot of you don't have what would be a good central leader tree, and you will see, but what I'm gonna focus on is how to make a central leader tree, because that's really the, it's a, the easiest kind of tree to prune, because that's where I can apply the rules. Um, what's a central, I'll show you more about it. it, it we, we generally try and keep our trees cone-shaped, I mean, you can imagine a tree that's shaped like this. When the sun's coming in, it hits the bottom branches. However, if a tree is shaped like this, a, I, mean, I should say it's I should say a cone shaped with the point up, because this is cone shaped too, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, you can imagine that's what the tree wants to kind of do naturally, because the they're, they want to survive and grow out and you know have all get all the light they can. So a upright cone, not a upside down cone, is what you're shooting for. The dormant pruning, any time from January through April through May, you can actually prune. I mean, if you didn't get your trees pruned and they're still in bloom, it's still okay to prune them. And then 
usually what we do when the fruit is setting, we don't prune and we can wait till the middle of the summer if we need to prune some more. All right, does everybody, do, I, I, do you know the difference between heading cuts and thinning cuts? Okay, good. So at least, so the take home message, you read that, but the take home message is all you do is go home and make thinning cuts. That's all I care about, at A, from the very start. Because if all you do is make thinning cuts in general, you'll be a lot better off. Why? Because heading cuts, it very much increase the vigor of the tree. Now, sometimes you want to do that. But I'm guessing in most cases, you don't want to do it. Thinning cuts create more of a balance. You can imagine if you adding, well, and you'll see, I'll explain it more. But just thinning cuts are almost always preferable to heading cuts, OK? And you'll, I'll show you the difference if you don't understand that. This is a central leader apple tree. Why is it a central leader apple tree? Because we have this one main trunk called, we call it a central leader. Um, the branches get smaller. Can you, can you picture the cone shape kind of here? That the branches are smaller in the top of the tree, then we have bigger, wider branches in the bottom of the tree. So can you kind of picture that cone shape? In a commercial orchard, we typically, we try and have these permanent scaffold branches at the bottom. And then again, smaller, shorter branches as we move up the tree. Now, Joanne, all the trees at Shulman Farm look like that, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to talk a little bit about getting trees from start from scratch, getting so they have this kind of appearance. Now, don't get too hung up on that because some of you are going to go home and you've got trees that don't quite look like this, and you're going to have to prune them. Just think thinning cuts, though, when you prune them anyways. And think about, think about you know, if I can try and keep the top of the tree a little bit narrower than the bottom of the tree, that's going to be a good thing. Again, here's in Central Eater, you know, right from the start when trees are small, you have to get them going. So that's what this is kind of all about. That's a Central Eater tree. Talk about young apple trees. Now, I notice you've got a plant sale coming up here, and there are some apple trees and cherry trees and maybe some pears and plums for sale in that. So after you plant a tree, almost no pruning is required, yes and no. Maintain the dominance of the central trunk. Now, you're going to get a tree, and I guarantee you, when you get it, it's going to kind of be a stick with a fairly dominant central trunk. It may have branches. It may not. But still, you're going to have that from the get-go. Once you plant that, your goal will be to keep that central trunk dominant. Because if you don't, you'll end up with the umbrella-shaped tree, the upside-down cone, which we don't really like. So let's get into talking a little bit about some of the basics, OK? Um, remove competitors. So just picture this tree. Here's your central leader kind of dominant trunk. And we've got some branches coming off of it. Anybody got trees at home that look like this at this point? Maybe. Um, but what's happening like right here, for example? Look at this one branch. Now, if we took this, if we took this branch and just left it, you could kind of see where we'd be starting to develop a tree that's going to kind of go up and form this umbrella shape. Now, I'm not sure where I'm headed here, but I'm just going to talk about it. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people would have a tendency, especially in the old days, we used to do a lot of, we'd come in here maybe and try and cut something off. Or we'd cut this off to make it shorter. Because remember, I kind of said, well, the branches should get shorter or smaller as you move up the tree. Clearly, this branch right here, where it, it comes off the trunk, is different than these branches. So it's kind of going straight up. So this kind of remove competitors to the leader is if you're and even now if you and again I'll, you'll you'll see some more pictures. So don't let me don't let me get bogged too bogged down. Here's another here's a branch here that's kind of problematic. See how this one is kind of growing straight up with the leader and even this one arguably could be. So what happens if we leave those and just let the tree get bigger? We kind of start to develop. Where's our central leader? Gone. I mean. One could argue, perhaps, this is it still. Don't know what happened here. These, these are not my pictures. Um, not really sure what happened here. <laughs> but you kind of want to try and avoid this situation where it's not clear where my central trunk is anymore. Um, and look, as the tree gets older, what do we got? We got what I would say, again, you can kind of see, well, things, you know, this tree is getting where the whole top canopy of the tree is as big or bigger 
than the bottom canopy. And you notice how I said, as you, I've been saying, when you go up the tree, you want the branches to get smaller. And when I usually mean smaller, diameter. But this one, both in terms of diameter and size, is much bigger than the branches underneath here. All right, question. So, um, I don't know, we're calling classic non dwarf trees with kind of a swirl um, structure, three main trunks, mm -hmm. kind of. I'm not talking about that, by the way, but go ahead. Well, that's what you seem to be, you seem to be recommending a completely different approach. <laughs> Well, it's what I'm more comfortable and familiar with, just because again, we don't most of the newer the you know trees that are less than 25 or 30 years old commercial orchards have all been trained to a central leader type tree. I'm not good. I'll be honest, right from the get go, I don't like doing old, big, standard trees. However, I w and and there's a there's a publication we sell in our bookstore that has some recommendations about pruning old apple trees. My advice, though, on those still is use thinning cuts in managing those trees from here on out. And I'm going to tell you what what a thinning cut is in a second, because I'm going to I'm going to go on and say, well, what do you think the solution to this problem is? Well, you know, again, some people might. You know, think well. I'm just gonna like chop this off a little bit closer. Like maybe chop it off right here. Yeah. But that's what we kind of call a heading cut. What we really want to do on this tree, and the, the, I mean, the, the cut should have been made a long time ago. But what if we went all the way back to the trunk and just cut this off? And, and that's a thinning cut where you go all the way back where the branch originates. Now maybe you can picture on some of your older. Um, upside down vase shaped trees it, it, you can do some thinning cuts here's another I like one one cut I like to do the work of a lot of cuts it's always to me it's better when you're trying to prune apple trees to do as few cuts as possible because the more cuts you do the more reinvigorating it becomes and like I said you'll see kind of some examples let's see where I'm headed here okay so you know the problem here is this should have been done a long time ago I mean that tree might have looked like this back when it was planted I don't know but you can see how that tree might have grown into a tree that looks like this. Because here, what, you know, again, arguably, what's our main leader? Well, is it this one or this one? It should have been this one. So what's the solution to this? Let's see what we got here. There's our, there's our main trunk going straight up, because the trunk should always be going straight up. We have this side branch, and we have this, what's called diameter-based pruning, I try and teach to the commercial growers. If a branch coming off the trunk is more than half the diameter of the trunk where it originates, it should be cut off. Mm -hmm. Now that is way more than half the diameter, right? So what's the solution to that? Well, again, the solution is not going up here somewhere and like shortening it way up. The solution is cutting it off using a... Yes, we're using a lopper, but what kind of cut is this? It's a thinning cut. It's what we call a thinning cut versus a heading cut. A thinning cut is where you remove the branch growing all the way back to its origin. So there we cut that off using a thinning cut. Now, you know, we got some other little things in here. Hopefully some of these will develop into some branches that we want. But if we leave this, if we leave this in here, the tree is you know, not in good from... That's why when you, pruning from an early age is important. Once you get into an older tree, well, then you're, then you're correcting problems that should have been corrected a long time ago. And I see this even in the commercial growers all the time. I get mad at them. You know, like, <laughs> so you see that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is kind of getting into more advanced strategies and techniques, but that's okay. Um, and you'll see some of this if you do the outdoor pruning session. But we talk about these bevel cuts and blah, blah, blah. You know, if you leave a little stub, kind of, when you make this kind of pruning, now here we go, we can, you know, some of the landscapers and tree people, I don't get into the worrying too much about, yes, you can cut too close, yes, you can leave too long a stub, somewhere in the middle is ideal, don't worry about it too much, because apple trees are very resilient, trust me. Um, I mean, they can be pruned in very many different ways, as long as they're pruned the right time of the year, and... Yeah, typically don't have a problem. The only thing you do want to avoid is you know that what do they call it? The collar of the branch. I mean, it, it, you know, you got you got a collar in here somewhere in the trunk, and you know, a good good pruning is not to cut into that collar area and get into the trunk because if you get 
any kind of disease going and it gets into the trunk, that's a bad thing. But little stubs like this are okay, and in some cases they can be advantageous because they can result in a new branch. Because when we, you notice when we cut this branch out, uh, go back, you know, we cut a lot of the tree off, I mean half the tree. And when you do that, automatically you wouldn't do any more pruning. Just leave it until next year to decide what to do. You've probably read the books and the rules about these bad crotch angles. Remember how I said, you know, all things being equal, you want to favor horizontal wood versus vertical wood? So wood that, why is this problematic? You tell me, somebody. You've, this is kind of classic. What's, what's, what's wrong here, kind of? Crowds the center. Mm -hmm. Crowds the center. Crowds the center. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what about this bad crotch angle thing? What if this was left to grow up here? Doesn't this form more of a weak joint here? And if we eventually let this grow up and add fruit, you know, and got heavy, it might break off. That's another reason why we don't like. So it. how is that? I'm thinking of my own house. So how is this? You know, I guess it. I guess, I guess it's it, it's a function of the way the the. Um, this structure forms when this branch is being formed, and I'm not, you know, I, I understand your question, but I'm not sure I know the answer. Just it's underlying weaker for whatever reason. Now, you know, look, this actually, I mean, it grew, you know, let's just say if we'd left that, it grew into this situation. I mean, that's probably might not break, but these things can break, and that's not good. But the real problem here, again, is, you know, where's our leader? Is it this one? Is it this one? Here, it is this one. But it's pretty hard to, and I'll, I'll talk about forks in a minute and whys. I'll try to. All right. Just, I think, I think Wes Audio threw some pictures in here just as examples of good trees, like what we should strive for. Again, we've got branches that get smaller as you go up the tree. This is a young central leader. Here's our leader. Here's some lower scaffolds. Notice, the, in general, the horizontal, this has probably been pruned, the horizontalness of this wood. And kind of here's this, why do we want horizontal wood? Well, one reason you want it is because horizontal wood is far more fruitful. It, has, it will form fruit buds and have a lot more fruit than if we let. Now, don't get me wrong, vertical wood can have fruit too. But in general, we, we want horizontal wood because it has more fruit. If you've got a big problem on a tree you just plant, a very young tree, correct it then. Sometimes it's hard. You just spent $20 on a tree from the conservation district, and you have a tree that comes in, and wow, it's got these like two things growing. And like, you know, it's hard to maybe cut one of them off, but you really need to, because it'll, it'll be much better for you in the long run. And maybe you won't get trees like that, but you probably will. Even the commercial growers get bad trees. We have good trees and bad trees. We won't get into that. I'm sure all the trees you get from the conservation district will be good trees. <laughs> But how can you make branches more horizontal? When the tree's young, we employ lots of different, this is really getting outside of pruning, but let's say you've got, you know, these, these branches are not breaking the, the diameter-based rule, the two to one rule, et cetera, and you're gonna keep them because you wanna keep some of them. Remember, I originally said try and prune as little as you can, a young tree. We use clothespins like this to make the branches, we call it early bending, more horizontal and get that good angle. These are really handy. So, you know, if you're going to get trees this spring, pay attention to this, because these are neat little tricks you can do to make your branch angles much better. In general, try and f promote horizontal growth. They develop good crotch angles. You can do this during the growing season. Um, I don't like this picture at all. I should take this out. Why? What's wrong with this picture? So they went and put a clothespin in here. Well, look at this branch is way more than half, or at least way more than half the diameter where it originates. And this is, again, where a lot of people get in trouble. And they, I don't blame them. They don't want to go cut off their, like I said, their, their tree they paid good money for. But this branch should never even be here. So I've noted in myself, just remove this slide from the talk. Oh, it's a good, I think, a good educational. This should have been cut off with a, a nice little thinning cut. Just got, get rid of it. Is there an issue looking at this one? The one they're keeping is... And I see that. Yeah, it. it's, yeah. Would you really have actually one. cut off? Still, I, still, I would have because I don't like a tree that goes up like this and then grows like this. You know, but we, you could bend this up more. But you know, the, this little stuff, the apple tree is just amazingly resilient. It'll heal over pretty readily. I mean, it's not good, 
But, you know, I, I still would have probably, still I would have just cut this one off. Because I don't... No, I, I cut that. What, this, this, this thing? Leave that one in the back and cut the rest of not following you, but that's... I, I'm going to... I'm going to keep... Oh, leave, the, leave this one and cut everything else off? Again, I don't like... No. The one in the back. Leave that one. Oh, this one way back here. Yeah, I can't really tell what's going on there, but maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, this is a fairly big branch too. But that, anyways, you can use the clothespins, but here the real problem is right here. This branch has been cut off. Uh, strong branch, good, good angle after you put the clothespin off. A better angle if you cut it off. If you've got a young apple tree and you can take any of the branches that you're going to keep and try and get them more horizontal, mm -hmm. you're going to be a lot happier. It's going to be easier to maintain the central leader. You're not going to have that umbrella-shaped trees. There's many different ways to do it. We used to do this. I don't do it anymore um, for various reasons. One thing is they fall out. But people make little, they make wooden spreaders with notches in the ends to put in between. Um, you can do this. You don't want to do this during the dormant season, more during the growing season, even though it's shown during the dormant season. Well, uh, maybe it's April. Just many different ways of trying to get stuff horizontal. We used to use these clips. Not, nobody uses them anymore. You can tie them down with string, which is the best way to do it because it stays there. All those other benders have a tendency to fall out. Just, again, you know, it's not... I'm not trying to be, it's not how you do it, it's knowing why you do it, I think is more important. Okay, question? Yep. Uh, once you make a cut on the uh, branch, do you put anything on the cut afterwards or just let it go? Pruning sealer or anything like that, you mean? We don't do anything. The commercial or in the commercial business, we do absolutely nothing. Now, if you're a homeowner and you've just got a few trees and it makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. But again, you know, and I'm not trying to be like, make light of it. That it's fine. We don't do it, in the and the commercial orchards would do it if they didn't have to make so many cuts. But I, I, we, I won't. You know, there's lots of debates about whether you put pruning seal or paint or whatever you want to call it on pruning cuts. In general, you don't need to on apple trees. They're pretty. They heal up quite nicely. Okay. Again, a landscaper or somebody in the nursery business would probably argue with me about it. And if it makes, like I said, it makes you feel better. In some cases, it might help. Uh, you know, some, the, the wound actually does heal up faster, I think, without it, though. At what point is it too late to do a thinning cut at the age of the tree? You can do a thinning cut any time. You can, you can prune it. But if you're going to do it, you've got dormant pruning, we've got summer pruning. I'm not going to talk a lot about summer pruning. You should do some both. Dormant pruning should be two-thirds to three-quarters of the pruning, but a little summer pruning doesn't help, especially in a vigorous tree, because summer pruning is less invigorating than dormant pruning. But you can do the thinning cuts. It doesn't matter. If all branches in a tree are set at the same angle, those at the top of the tree will be most vigorous. Yes. Again, I kind of alluded to that, because the tree wants to survive, wants to grow up and get sunlight, compete with its neighbors. It wants to grow up there. Uh, to maintain an appropriate distribution of, distribution of vigor, make branches at the bottom more upright than those at the top. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, it's not a bad idea. Just a little bit to think about. Um, more, I'd, I'd say more along the lines, you've got branches at the top, bend those down more severely than the branches at the bottom, if you're going to bend them at all. Don't, don't get too hung up on bending, but... A good, this is a good concept to keep in mind because this bending process is also deinvigorating. Remember what I said? We want branches to become smaller and less vigorous at the top of the tree. And they can be a little more stronger and vigorous in the bottom of the tree. That's a great tree, by the way. But again, we have a strong, we can see our central leader. In general, the branches are bigger in the bottom of the tree. Now, this is kind of a high density type orchard. This is what I, I think this picture was taken in Europe where they um, pioneered kind of this high-density type thing. What do you think of this? All right. All those in favor, raise your hand. Don't be shy. All those against? Why? This, so let me just, I mean, good. This is not a bad, this is not a bad semi-dwarf central leader tree. Why? <coughs> Give me, tell me why. 
a few people. I mean, kind of, it's got my main dominant trunk here still, right? Got, got a lot of horizontal, like horizontality to the wood. I mean, a lot, and this has been pruned, I think. Just, it's been pruned. Um, a lot of, you know, the wood's horizontal in general. Now, here's kind of, you know, how things want at the top of the tree, want to grow a little more upright. Of course, these have been managed longer, too. These have been managed last time. Now, I don't particularly care for some of the cuts they made here. Is that a thinning cut? No. 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 They, we used to do a lot of this with these old semi-dwarf trees for various reasons. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, I tell the grower a branch like, what we, what, what we promote more now is using thinning cuts and removing these branches entirely. But I'll tell the grower to let this just grow out and fruit, and I call it crop and flop. <laughs> So it crops, it grows. If we let it grow out, if you got a good tree from the beginning, this will this will fruit for three or four years, and it'll kind of naturally um, fruiting is your best form of growth control, by the way. It'll, it'll crop and flop, and then we go in here with a thinning cut and cut it off. That's my new, right, Joanne? That's what we were talking about. Anyways, and so, but you know, the branches generally get smaller. And notice, right? I can't. No, I, I don't know. Notice right here. Remember, we had this was a problem. I think this was a branch. It was a big branch. It was growing up like this, and it was cut off, as you can see. It's always not a bad idea to stake any tree because I'll tell you why. If you stake it, you can tie that central leader to the stake and really keep that growing straight up. So yes, staking is a good idea. You know, you can you can do the central leader thing again. We now this is obviously a very high density orchard. By the way, I it, we have this whole series called Mass Aggies. I haven't had one, and one of the ones I used to do is the 25 tree, 50 foot fruiting wall. Which with, this is the we actually planted when I would do these Mass Aggies. When I did this one, we'd actually go somewhere. For example, at Sholin Farm. We did one in Sholin? I don't remember that. Really? Where is it? Is it still there? It's down next, adjacent to the... We could go look at it. Um, but, but the point here, again, is, you know, we can do this, we can apply this kind of central leader principle. You know, we got a big central leader. The only difference here is really all the branches up and down the tree are the same size. Flowers and fruit on two-year-old and older wood, just keep that in mind. Now, out here is a piece of one-year-old wood. If we cut that off, some people will have a tendency, that's where I see the most of, they kind of like, because well, a lot of this one-year-old wood has a tendency to grow straight up. Go and cut this off. If you just go in and cut this off all the time, you'll never get any new fruity wood. So next year, this should look like this. <coughs> just, okay, it's, and, and really when you go home and look at your trees, just make sure you know where your fruit is coming up this year and what kind of wood I'm gonna be growing this year to have flower buds one, two, three years down the road. Right. These, if you can keep these principles in mind, this will get you a long ways. And I, again, focusing on center leader, but you can apply some of these to your wrangly looking old apple trees. Remove two to three of the largest limbs in the top two thirds of the tree. Use the two to one rule. I've already hinted at some of this stuff. Avoid stubbing or heading cuts. Simplify branches. I haven't really talked about that, but I will. Using thinning cuts. Remove drooping branches. Okay, stuff growing vertically, either upright or straight down, generally are not good. Remember I said, just want to favor as much horizontal wood as you can. Remove branches growing straight up. Maintain the central leader. What about when the central leader gets up there after 30 years? Do you cut it off so you can reach the apple? Cut the tree down and buy a new tree from the condo. So I'm sorry, what was your, uh, you, what, do you, what do you do? When it gets to be 30 years old? Still producing. He wants to know what do you do to the top. Do you ever cut that off? Well, let me, let me get through this kind of, maybe I'll answer your question, but I, I still say use thinning cuts to remove some of those big branches in the top of the tree and use it, just you can take a whole branch out just so you can open the top of that tree up. It's, that's better than trying to micromanage that top, I think. I don't know if that answers your question. I can picture, this is the problem with doing this, again, because I come from the central leader commercial orchard. I never really, I mean, I don't enjoy, trust me, doing, you know, heirloom old 50-year-old trees. 
But if you just use, think about, you know, the principles of thinning cuts, just thin out and, and try and keep some light coming into the bottom of the tree because that will reinvigorate the bottom. I mean, you know, it's easy to grow tons of apples and fruit way up in the top of the tree, but you can't pick it. So that's kind of, you know, the reason. Can you cut it off? Yes, you can. But that's kind of, if you can avoid cutting it off, it's a good idea because the problem is if you cut it off, the tree wants to just blow up and you know, grow again. But you'll see some, okay? I, I really, I wish, um, I apologize, but just, just remember thinning cuts, trust me. Even if you just approach that tree with thinning cuts. All right. So in the new, we re removed two to three of the largest limbs in the top two thirds. And maybe you couldn't do this on your tree. I don't know. I'd have to see it. So just some pictures showing. See, uh, we're, we're just kind of getting rid of some of those using thinning cuts. They've kind of cropped and flopped a little bit. I mean, this branch has fruited for two, three, four years. Rather than trying to cut it back or manage it, manage it now, what we do in the commercial business is just remove it. All right. So you see that? So I'm just kind of telling you, think about the top and getting rid of a few big branches in the top of your tree. Don't let them stay there, just cut them out. All right. This diameter-based pruning, the two to one rule, I should call it the 50% rule really, because two to one, one two to one. So you gotta, again, I've got my leader here, I've got a branch here, and this branch is way more than half the, well, you can start to see what happens when you leave big branches, how the growth kind of like goes different all in the, the you know, to all of them. You try and want to try and avoid that. Perhaps this isn't the best example. I don't know. What am I going to do here? Well, there's my, there's my trunk, arguably, although maybe the trunk's down here. It's a little bigger. Where's the trunk? But look what happened. We left, we left a couple big branches here. Yeah, this one and this one. And it was big here, but now all my energy is going into here, here, and here. It's being split up in thirds, whereas these branches, if I got rid of them, would strengthen this trunk and make that, again, my dominant feature. And you can, you can do that with a tree you already have or new trees. That's a good idea. So this one, you know, this branch clearly is way more than half the diameter of where it originates. What you don't want to do, if you're going to uh, avoid it, and now this is this is this breaks the rule. But what you don't want to do is this. Okay, that's a heading cut. This is we kind of stage this as extreme examples. I don't like it. <laughs> but what you do want to do is this. You you want to completely cut it off. And this, just try this. See, this is a bad example, but still, what the the problem is? This should have been done at a much earlier age. It shouldn't have been left that long. There you go. So would you cut off both the right large limb and the left large limb in the same year, or would you do one? Mm -hmm. So my, you know, that's, it gets a little subjective. Yeah, you, my, my rule of thumb is you don't want to generally prune more than like 20 to 25% of the tree every year. So if removing these two branches resulted in 50% of the tree being gone, yes, I might do this one one year and the other one the next year. And I would do the most egregious one, obviously, first. There's probably many different ways to teach pruning. I mean, that's a good, you know, we, I didn't, we didn't talk about that. But in general, you don't want to go and hack the tree up so bad because large, I mean, it'll regrow. But that's not the objective just to have it regrow a lot. The objective is to produce fruit. All right, what about this? Does you like this kind of cut? It's kind of a heading cut. Yeah, again, I mean, I, I say... A thinning cut is when you remove the branch all the way back to its point of origin. This this did not happen here, and this is particularly bad. This I don't know, I don't remember where this picture came from. You never want to cut back to upright wood. Why? I've explained to you that in general. I mean, you know, now it's and I see people do this. You know, they're trying to shorten it, and that's all fine because we're trying to make the top a little shorter and yada yada yada. Lots of good examples of bad stuff here. But you never want to cut back to an upright. Now what, instead of doing, we get this branch here, which is smaller than the diameter of the trunk. If this branch is in the top of the tree and it's, it's worked for two or three or four years, perhaps I'd all go back and cut it all the way off, leaving a stub cut, and then I would grow a new branch. Yeah. It tried, yeah I'm not gonna, well, I call them stub cuts now. Just cause, all right, let me just, where did we go from here? 
What's he doing? What this, this is bad? What what what? He, I I I was looking at this last night trying to figure out what was going on. Trust me. <laughs> what we what? This is West audio slide. He he went back and cut all the way back to here, and that's. Well, actually, I would have probably cut this one off. Let's let's just let's just skip over those. <laughs> All right, so you kind of, let's say you develop these horizontal wood. Now, here's the other thing. If you've got some main branches and they're not breaking the rule and I'm going to keep them, the other thing, I almost like to treat these like I do the leader. Look at them like you do the leader. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting some big branching, particularly if it's going out, you know, down, crossing another branch, you know, there's kind of a, a basic rule of pruning. Crossing branches aren't so great. We're cutting this off. We're not shortening it up using a stub or heading cut. We're going to cut the thing off completely. So this is what I say by simplify branches. One thing, if you can simplify your branches, again, these thinning cuts, I can make one cut here and do a world of good versus going in here and trying to maybe micromanage this branch a little bit. But that's what we mean by simplify branches. Here's a branch. Um, how are we going to simplify this? We're going to cut this one off. So all I have is this kind of one left. Now, let me talk about forks or whys. These, this is what I call a Y or a fork. And again, the, the leader thing with the two to one rule, there's a Y or a fork in the tree. I read somewhere once that forks belong on your supper table, not in your orchard. So just keep thinking about that. Because whenever I've got stru tree structure and I see, if this was a central leader, certainly you'd cut this off, right? Because I'd be growing a double leader tree. Even on your side branches, when you start to see these forks and it, it's getting crowded, we kind of used to, I used to have another expression, kind of the odd man out. This one's kind of the middle of these two. So, you know, maybe I'd, I'd keep this one and keep this one and cut this one out. But again, I, I look at it as where I've got a fork would be a, you know, this, this down here is not a fork. You know, I've got this little branch coming off, but this is a fork. So I don't care if you can get rid of some forks or Y structures, I call them, in your orchard, no matter how old the tree, using thinning cuts, I think that's a good pruning strategy, this, uh, the simplest pruning strategy. Just remember the rules. Remove drooping branches, yes. In general, upright branches and stuff that goes down, you can cut out using a thinning cut. I'm cutting it all the way back to where it originates. This is small, weak wood, shaded. We'll never have good fruit on it. Gets in the way of management mowing. Remove upright branches. Now, well, how, how old is this wood right here? Can you kind of see it? You have to guess. Well, it might just be one-year-old wood. It might have all grown last year. Again, you want to keep some of this, but if it's rather vertical and egregious, it should probably be cut out. So, I don't know if we got more. What else? See, here, here's one that was probably left. Should have been cut out a while ago. And, you know, again, in general, just if, if I cut this out, there's a few other very vertical branches. You just want to, I mean, this branch is beautiful right here. It's fairly horizontal. This one's kind of nice over here. Fairly horizontal. This one's nice. Fairly horizontal, but we got this like outlier here that you know that's pretty obvious. Don't just go up here and like cut it off here though. There, right? Cut the whole thing out. Thinning cuts. The whole these all these trees could be done with thinning cuts. Now, when you get situations like this, and you got I'm sure you've all seen it, you got especially older trees, this is why we don't grow trees in the commercial orchard like this anymore. It's too much work. You get all these, what we call suckers. And these, this is all one-year-old wood. We probably do not want these to be developing into fruiting wood. They've all got to come out. That's just a maintenance task. Okay? This is why I don't like pruning older trees anymore. It's very time-consuming, a maintenance task. Maintain the central leader if you can. So, you know, there's problems if it gets too high. You can't pick the fruit. You can't spray it. It starts to shade the next row. A lot of people do this. Now... That's okay, but if you do this, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to explode in growth. And I don't have any good before and after. Let me just see where he heads here. This is not correct, he says. <laughs> again, because, but, but we have to do it because the tree's getting too tall. But see, again, this thing is chopped off. And what has happened is, you know, you chop it off, the energy's got to go somewhere, it goes into these kind of big, look, look at this big honking branch. Now, I could argue maybe that's the central leader now. Of course, once it gets up to this height, if I chopped it off, I don't care about the central leader anymore, obviously. 
But you, you just, you know, you redirect growth, and then you, now I've got lots of vigor at the top of my tree. This branch is bigger than this branch. What would, what would I say? I like my branches to get smaller. It doesn't always work, but a far better thing would be to just let this keep growing, and you could actually, if you would like chop, no, I shouldn't say chopped, thin, using a thinning cut, cut this branch off, let this grow up maybe, it might crop and flop. Remember what I said about fruit your best, is your best form of growth control. So if you can live with it a few years, you might be better off. But it's kind of getting into advanced topics. Whenever you have to go chop a tree off, it's problematic. You know, the fruiting wild kind of thing, if you want to do it, that's what it looks like. Well, this is how I grow all my trees in Belchertown now. But it's an interesting way to grow trees. But seriously, if you're thinking about doing it, you know, you can have a nice little tiny little orchard of small little trees at about 50 feet. Other ways to affect growth and crop problem. Sometimes you get trees, little, this is mostly little trees, like if you buy trees this spring, and sometimes it's hard to get branches to grow it. And if, of course it's hard. There's this technique called notching, um, which disrupts the flow of in the uh, vascular tissue. Left, uh, this is left by its own devices. You know, picture this tree as being kind of this whip growing way up here. Um, the top of the tree produces hormones, which have a tendency to inhibit these lower lower buds. That's again, getting back to the uh, biology of the tree, it wants to be out compete its neighbors and grow up. So it really wants to grow at the top. But sometimes you'll get a tree, all of a sudden they'll start growing at the top. But I don't have any really good pictures. And you won't get any branches down where you want them. So if you get a tree that's, let's say, a whip, you know what I mean by whip, it's just this one little tree. And it's not a bad idea to go in and use, I use a, ha I use a hacksaw blade and just make this little notch right above where you see some branches. Now you don't want to make them all the way down here. You don't want branches down there. But about knee height or above is a nice little technique to get um, some branches growing. But you can see where the notch was made above a bud, and that should make that bud break and come out, which it did right here. See how a notch was made? Um, this is one year after notching, and this little branch grew out. Kind of something to think about. Uh, again, it's whether you do it or not is, is optional, but it can help promote branching in the tree, especially in the bottom. The timing of this is notched. Full bloom minus six, full bloom minus four, about two to three weeks before full bloom, before bloom. So basically, when the tree is about ready to start growing is when you should notch it. A couple people came up during the break and asked me about, you know, they chopped the tree off at the top and now you've got all this mess up here and what do I do? You know, if you, if, if, if you would, rather than chopping it off, maybe let it grow up higher by itself and just remove some of these big branches, one or two every year, you might have a better situation. There, there's no really good solution to this problem. Um, see where he's headed here. Again, this tree was probably chopped off right here. I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when it's a bad cut, I call it chopped. Chopped off, and then you've got all this you know, shoot growth growing up. What's the solution? Well, one solution is you just got to go in and manage this every year and cut some of this one-year wood off. Maybe try and leave some of the one-year wood that's more horizontal, or at least at a 45-degree angle. Cut the stuff going straight out, but don't try and get try and cut as little as you can. If you've got an excessively vigorous tree and it's not a really big tree yet, you can do use a practice we call trunk scoring where you basically take a, this is a linoleum knife, I believe, on bigger trees, we've used chainsaws to make a, a you, you cut into the bark. The cambium is just below the bark here, and that's where the main mineral flow occurs. Water moves deeper inside the trunk, but the nutrients move fairly, fairly um, just under the bark. And if you can cut the flow of nutrients off, you can devigorize the tree. Cut the wood completely around the trunk. Now, you can also gurgle the tree. That's why I don't necessarily like this topic. If you're not careful and you girdle the tree, it can kill the tree. Best done near petal fall. Scoring will slow growth and encourage flower bud formation. Yes, it will. Sometimes. 
because I've seen it when it doesn't work at all well either. Now, we used to promote this, again, in the commercial business when we were growing a lot of semi-dwarf trees that we had bigger problems with, there was a lot of research done on this. We don't do this anymore because we don't grow semi-dwarf trees. We grow fully dwarf trees. By the way, what rootstock are those, uh, is your, your tree sale on? It doesn't say, does it? It doesn't say on there. No. It is a Semi-dwarf? Semi I forget that information from our grower. Uh, okay. Yeah, you should know what rootstock your tree is on because that will help you decide how eventually how trees how big the tree is going to get. If it's a semi-dwarf, my guess is it's going to be M7. And a lot of these pictures I've shown you probably are M7 trees. We don't plant M7s anymore, right, Joanne? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not good. Um, Scoring will slow the growth and encourage flower bud formation. You know if the tree gets bigger, you got a bigger trunk, you got to be more aggressive. But, you know, again, if you're not careful and you, you take that cut, what we would do is make a cut on each side, but not complete the cuts, because if you do, you could curl it. More drastic than scoring, but gives a similar effect. Yeah. Oh, here's a, he's a, he's, see, they, we, in the old days, they did a lot of research on this, and I guess this tree was not scored or ringed or whatever this one was, you can kind of see, uh, if that's the case, it really did help control the top of the tree. We used to, we used to do, not a lot, we, we did a lot of, no, we take a chainsaw and really give the trees a good knock. How far up? Right at, near the base, below, below where your branches start. So, although, you know, if you had a really vigorous tree, uh, you could do it up farther up, near the top. I'd still better off managing it with pruning using thinning cuts, if you want my opinion. I, I should probably not. If you do everything right, success, you'll get apples. So I think that's the end of the apples. Um, so, and I already mentioned, you know, pears have a different growth habit, but they, they fruit on two-year-old wood. Cherries fruit on two-, three-, and four-year-old wood. I was um, having a question about cherries. Um, Sweet cherries are real difficult to grow in this climate. If any, anybody who's grown, growing sweet cherries successfully and have, has cherries, the trees will grow. There's a lot, I have a lot of sayings about it. sweet cherry trees love to die. It's, it's, easy, uh, it's, it's easy to grow a cherry tree, but hard to grow cherries. <laughs> so I'm not going to cover those. Um, you know, if, you can grow ap if you grow apples very successfully and you grow peaches very successfully, yeah, yeah, and you want to try cherries and you're a glutton for punishment, try it. <laughs> and peaches are arguably the easiest thing to grow. The peaches, I mean, apples have a lot more kind of like, um, yes, and, uh, but other than, other than where uh, peaches are not terribly cold hardy, um, they're the easiest thing to grow. And I'll kind of tell you why. Peaches grow like a weed. Apple trees, yeah, they grow like a weed left by themselves, but because peach, peach quality is not as dependent on some of the apple quality techniques. Anyways, we typically grow peaches in what's called this open vase, train, open center training system, or open vase. Now, how's that different than the central leader? Here's where I'm saying, this is what I do peaches. Entirely different than the central leader. You notice these trees don't really have any central trunk growing straight up. This one might look like it does, but in reality, this kind of thing is coming out towards us. We typically grow peaches kind of like with one, two, three, these kind of four main scaffold branches you see in an open vase. It's not, it's a cone, but it's inverted. Now, how do you think we get there? How compared to apples? Peach pruning. Prune near bloom time. Now here's a big difference. We generally don't prune peaches in the middle of the winter because they, that's why they're less winter hardy. They have a tendency to stay more alive over the course of the winter and pruning has a tendency to bring them out of dormancy and you don't want to do that in the middle of the winter. Apples don't care. They're just fine and dandy. So we, we typically prune peaches in the spring when they're growing actually. And we only prune them on dry days because we're less likely to spread disease. Now, apples less important. You can prune apples when it's sunny, when it's raining, when it's sleeting, when it's snowing. I don't care. It doesn't make a difference. Preferably not when it's sleeting or snowing. They heal quicker during the growing season than they do during the dormant season. Apples don't really heal. They just kind of sit there. 
this cytospora canker, various cankers. I mean, as soon as you cut a peach tree or damage it, that's the beginning of the end with peaches, kind of. Just think, keep thinking about that, primary reason for peach tree death. Strong, strong upright shoot suckers should be removed in late June and early July. And that, that, if you have strong up, I didn't talk about summer pruning at apples at all, but a little summer pruning, again, using thinning cuts, removing uh, vertical wood, obviously stuff that doesn't have fruit on it, because typically you don't want to take your fruit off once you get in the summer. It's not a bad idea. Good idea with peaches, too. Remove broken or dead wood. So, you know, again, this is, I didn't, it's kind of, you know, real basic stuff. If you have broken or dead wood, yes, you always prune that out. That applies to apples, too. This is canker that we see in peaches. It could be cytospora. Don't get hung up on it. I'm sure any of you have peach trees have probably seen gumming in your peach trees. And gumming, this gumming is a result of injury and infection. And it's the beginning of the end. I tell people, you know, if you get a peach tree and you crop, peach trees will start cropping after the third year or so. And if you crop it for seven or eight years, you're, at that point in time, you're probably better off pulling it out and planting a new one. Now, you can keep them going, but they typically, you know, get more disease problems and your productivity declines and yada, yada, yada. To get that vase-shaped tree, it's really quite simple. What you want to do, if you get a peach tree and it looks like that, you go in and cut it off. Now, I didn't tell you to do that to your apple tree, did I? Why? Because if you did that to an apple tree, you know, get, unless you want to grow an open vase apple tree, and if you want to, be my guest. We do with peaches, although I, you can grow a central eater peach too. I, I do a lot of them. Um, but you, if, we, if we went and cut this off, then what do you think is going to happen? We're going to make our, all our vigorous growth down here, where it's kind of where we want it. You kind of want our scaffold branches to start down around knee height. We're not, going to we're not going to focus on the central ear. We're just going to chop it off. That's all you do the first year. It ends up looking like that. You're going to let it grow. And then after two or three years, you're going to start selecting to four of these kind of equally sized main scaffolds. So where this is kind of the antithesis of everything I've been telling you about the central ear apple. We want to take our growth and distribute it evenly amongst these four branches. Those are the arms, the open center. So here's before, and I don't know if you can picture, I'm guessing, so what are we going to keep maybe? We're going to keep this one, this one, something over here, and something over here. Kind of evenly, dis evenly distributed. Well, I was right maybe on two of them. So now you got one, two, these three, four, kind of nice. You've got an open center. After one or two years, that's all the pruning we do. Let it grow another year. Peaches fruit on one-year-old wood, so you, this is why I call them a weed. It's actually pretty hard to screw up peaches. But as long as you grow new one-year-old wood every year, you will have peaches. Oh, he's got a close-up. This actually, these are, these are flower buds, the axillary buds. This is your shoot that's going to grow new shoot bud. Now these little things are the ones that when it gets to minus 10, I don't know, what was it around here this morning? Minus 7? When it gets to minus 10 Fahrenheit, what happens is these buds get killed and you don't have any flower buds. And that's the big problem with peaches. So back in what year was it, 2014? No, it was, it was February 14th, two years ago, Joanne. We lost about the whole peach crop in Massachusetts because it got, got to like 14 below. That's the reason. The peach trees didn't die. They survived. They just didn't have any. Because uh, if you kill all your flower buds that were formed the year before, you don't have any fruit. So, but they, you grow this one-year-old wood, that's where all your, all your peach fruit is. But the other thing, you know, somewhat similar to apple trees, you want to maintain a favorable light environment. So we will cut off, you know, really vigorous, upright growing wood. We kind of want these scaffolds to grow out. They, peaches want to grow, I call it crepitus. I tell the growers, they want to grow up and out. And again, all your crop is up here. If you don't prune them and kind of like chop, peaches you can chop more than you can apples. You can chop peaches back, kind of, and be just fine because as long as you grow new one-year-old wood, you're all good. But again, this, you know, more up, this becomes strong because it's growing upright. You want to get rid of some of that stuff. You want your peaches to be kind of growing out like this and not up like this. 
So that's kind of if you a take home message on growing peaches. Again, here's a strong upright shoe we're going to cut out. Here, see this? Strong upright. You want them to kind of be growing out. We probably cut some out of here already, some strong upright shoots. Kind of keep this open center concept. You want to keep the center of the tree open. Using thinning cuts. Don't do any heading cuts. Just cut out your older. Here's all your fruiting wood. This is kind of the nice fruiting wood you want. This thing may have fruited last year, but now it's becoming too big. Here's my scaffold kind of growing out at a 45 degree angle. Get rid of the verticals. What's that? Yeah, there's a fork or a Y. Remember how I said they don't belong in your orchard? The same could be said for peach trees. In general, any kind of, you're out there pruning any of your fruit trees and you see forks or Ys, it's getting crowded. And to cut one of them out is not a bad idea. Usually the smaller one. Let this one keep growing. Usually a smaller one. Here's another fork or Y. Probably after I make this cut, I'll come up here and cut this more vertical one out. Remember, these healthy pencil-sized one-year-old shoots is what you want to strive for with peach trees. <laughs> Apply some of the same principles, but just again, no, you've got to, you obviously don't want to go cut all this wood out because you'd be cutting your crop out. You want to have your structure, and then you want to have maybe your one and two year old peach wood coming off that structure. You don't want to let three or four year old wood grow off that structure. That's the stuff going back, like that should come out eventually. All this little small stuff, you really, if you have time, you should prune it out. See, I'm just cutting a little stuff out because this has a tendency to be weak and get canker in it, which helps your tree decline. See, we cut some of these smaller shoots out because we really don't need them. If we only need 50 to 75 of these fairly long shoots per tree, you can afford to get rid of some of this small stuff, kind of advanced. I mean, I'm not saying it's advanced, but sometimes I don't get to it. No big deal. Peach thinning. I don't know, you know how many people have had experience with this, but if you, your peaches are really small and green, never ripen up properly, you we have to spend, the commercial guys spend a lot of time hand thinning them. So in a shoot like this, if left to its own devices, might have four or five or six peaches on it, and they'd all be kind of like clustered up here together. Really, ideally, we really, peaches need to be a good six to eight inches apart. And it's hard to get to do, but when the peaches are little tiny things, you should go in and pull those off by hand. You'll have much better peaches in the end. It doesn't, peaches don't really have biennial bearing problems because again, as long as I'm growing this new shoot here and growing many of them throughout the tree, I'll have peaches next year. He says leave a fruit every eight to 10 inches. Remove, this is su summer pruning. Uh, it's not very, I mean, three, they're, they're freaking weeds, trust me. <laughs> We don't spend enough time summer pruning because everybody gets busy, but if you can spend some time removing some upright, again, you don't need all this because that'll give you way more peaches next year than you need. I don't have a good before and after. I should work on that. But if there's some vigorous upright shoots, and if, I, if you went in there and ducked your head in there, you'd maybe see these things are like really growing rapidly, three to four feet. You can cut those off in the middle of the summer. Don't do it in the fall. Do it in the middle of summer. Don't wait till late summer. Not a bad idea. Do it just before harvest. Now these don't have any peaches on them, so that's a little bit of a... So anyways, this is a bad example because yes, you can still get big peaches even if you leave them close <laughs> together, but that's the goal to have good peaches. And we have success. Let me just, if you want more information, I don't, don't go to umassfruit.com. You won't find what you're looking for. <laughs> that's for the commercial growers. You may. You may, you may find me, you'll find my email and then email me, which I took my phone number I took my phone number off though, by the way. <laughs> I don't mind if you call me. It's the spam calls. Um, you know, we get a lot of stuff on we, I started doing videos and putting them on YouTube a long time ago, but then there's a lot of stuff out there now. And it's good stuff, you know, by and large. Better than what we have, some of it. You can find lots of pruning videos, lots of help. These Mass Aggie seminars, so in three weeks, I'm going to be in East Hampton, which is in the Connecticut River Valley, doing one of these Mass Aggie seminars on pruning. I do this talk, but a little bit shortened, because we only got two hours. We do indoor and outdoor in the same session. But I charge $45 an individual for those. So you're, 
I would have loved if everyone to do it. Pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be a little careful doing these because you know it's a little bit of a conflict. But perhaps you know in a couple of years you can schedule one out in this neck of the woods. We did one at Shulman Farms actually five or six years ago. And you've done. We have different. It's not just me doing apples. We have different things. But UMassGarden.com. If you're really serious, you'll get more in depth because you know it's hard. This is hard to teach in a classroom setting. Feel free to email me if you've got any questions, if you want this talk. I have a link to a place where I've got a bunch of homeowner resources, which I, I can share that link with you. I didn't bring them with me, and frankly, I'm not, it's kind of a, a derelict old link, but it still works. But there's some of my pruning presentations on there. There's other stuff, too, you know, questions about. We have, where are we doing, uh, oh, we're doing a mass aggie on pest management in April at, at uh, Red Apple Farm in Phillipston. So you're welcome to sign up for that. And again, just remember, I work for UMass Extension, not the Stockbridge School of Agriculture, although they're related. Now, this book is still available, and this has a, at the end of it, you can order this, UMassExtensionBookstore.com, um, has a section on pruning old, neglected trees in the back of it. It is focused on some of the pictures that I showed you come out of here. It's focused on central leader trees. Um, but it's, ten, it's only 10 bucks. It was five. I told them it's worth at least 10. They minus the price. They still have them, I think. So, you know, if you want, it's a good book. Trust me. I wish, I don't know what we're going to, I need to think about what we're going to do about getting it reprinted. And actually, we should put it on Amazon because we'd sell a lot more. But that is there. I just added that to the talk because I went and checked this morning. It's still there. And I think that is the official end of my talk. Don't any, let me just, let me just, um, Talk about tools a little bit because Joanne wanted me to talk about tools. Can you hear me okay? Or mm -hmm. I can bring them. Um, Test. Thank you. So this is your this is your best friend, I think, um, or a little saw. Hand pruners are okay, but only on little trees. I mean, and they're okay on big trees, but they take a lot of time. But the point is, what was, I, I, I told you make bigger cuts. And to make bigger cuts, you need something a little heftier like this, right? So if you just took these out and this to your older trees and didn't worry about the little stuff, you'd be far better off. In other words, don't go to your old trees and nitpick here and there and take little cuts. Try and make a few big strategic cuts. Open up the tree. The tree will be a lot happier using thinning cuts. If you can buy good tools, we have a, uh, we're very lucky to have a place called Orchard Equipment and Supply Company in Conway, Oesco Inc, O-E-S-C-O Inc dot com, sells really high quality, they sell cheap pruning tools too, but they do sell, you know, real good quality pruning tools. If you do any significant amount of pruning, it's really good to have, I mean, these, I don't know, these, well, these were only $83, that's not bad, but you can't pick these up at Home Depot. And they sell pruning tools, but they're marginally cheap. Yeah, and they're, you know, for your purposes, they're probably okay. The other thing is keep your pruning tools sharp, and all you need is one of these files. What, who, who here is savvy in these days? What do you call it? What kind of file is this? Bastard. No bastard file, right? I didn't want to say it. You did first, so. I don't know if they still market them. I, I used to work at Avishon Hardware before. That was one of my gigs before, between college and UVM. Yeah, we call this a mill bastard file. And, you know, oh, I just, there's always the subject of bypass versus anvil style pruners, right? I prefer bypass. This is, this is a little nice little pair of hand pruners. It's bypass. This is bypass. I won't go into the details because Joanne will in the outdoor pruning session on how to properly keep these sharp. But a mill bastard file and you just sharpen one edge is all you need. I do, I don't know why, I do have a pair of ammo pruners, which actually aren't bad. Somebody, it seems Oesco's been pushing these a little harder. I still don't like them as much, um, especially cheap ones. And this, this is a little harder to keep sharp because you've got to sharpen both edges. And if you don't have, you don't have that good mating of surfaces, but they use these in Europe more for some reason. Maybe they have a, a better cut. Don't worry about the cleanliness or your cuts too much. Just cut. It's not, especially in apples, it's not a big deal. Don't be afraid to cut. Don't be afraid to prune. Keep in mind, you want to open up the tree, use thinning cuts, and you'll all be fine and dandy. Thank you.